Welcome to Sector Report. I'm David Beaton. This week, governments talk about free trade, but is it fair trade? What's driving the growth of recycling around our farms? And who's breathing life into an old mill and why? If the wool farmer expects to get a better dollar, then he actually has to be associated with the product that's made from it. New Zealand wool boomed in the 50s. At our peak, we had 18 woolen mills turning out 10,000 tonnes of carpet a year and 3 million square yards of fabric. 20 years later, 30 years later, all the major mills are closed. Even our small mills are struggling. Recently, Cavaliers closed its mill in Onihanga and Summits cut its staff in Omaru. But further south, it's a different story. Rural Affairs correspondent Neil Parker explores the rebirth of Milton's 116-year-old Bruce Woolen Mill. What drives you to succeed? I don't fail easily. Um, anybody who knows me would say I think too much. That one's hit the hard. Cliff Heath is a determined man. Never give up. There's a time to advance. You know, a time to, to, to retreat and a time to go home and, 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 and recoup. Cliff Heath has put a few noses out of joint in his time. I've always said what I think, and that's always come with measured argument. Cliff Heath says he would rather be remembered for what he has achieved than for being nice to everybody, for the sake of being nice. Which is why he bought the mill. Milton, the town of opportunities. The sign says it all, but it could also say lucky town. Surrounded by farms, the town has a sawmill, a prison, and thanks to Cliff Heath, it's still got a woolen mill. The Bruce Woolen Mill has stood at the end of Edward Street since it was built by a group of sheep farmers in 1897. For more than a century, the mill has scoured, carded, spun and woven wool into fine yarns for the New Zealand textile industry. In its day, 400 people would work here. My husband's worked here, my husband's father and mother have worked here, and my husband's grandfather and grandmother both worked here. So it's a bit of a family tradition as well. Don't think you'll find anyone in Milton that hasn't really worked here in their time. In 1999, the mill closed for the first time. In April of this year, Cliff Heath and a consortium of the mill's customers bought the mill and saved it from closing a second time. The mill would have shut, closed, and that would have then probably toppled, for the want of a better word, a number of companies that were distinctly dependent on that for um, that mill for yarn. Cliff Heath says back in 1897, farmers understood what the issues were. And those issues are the same today. Cliff bought his first sheep farm in 1992 and was horrified at the lack of vision in the industry. Well, I'm passionate about wool and that's one of the things. There's a, lot of, there's a big difference between wool and sheep. The sheep happens to grow it, but the wool comes off it. It's not a product. Wool's just a rough industrial ingredient that can then be converted into, into distinctly unique and high quality products. These days, Cliff Heath is on his fourth farm, Te Hekenga Station, at the top of the world in the northern Manawatu. He farms nearly 8,000 sheep and some 500 head of Black Angus cattle. If the wool farmer expects to get a better dollar, then he actually has to be associated with the product that's made from it. Cliff Heath says that the textile industry has suffered since the Lange government got rid of the Development Finance Corporation in the 1980s. Free trade agreements have been good for dairy, but textiles have been the biggest casualty. He says that with hindsight, the wool board should not have been disestablished in 2003. Significant disagreements between Merino and crossbred growers were a piece of farmer politics that diverted attention away from the real problems of the time. Well. There's also a saying that says, well, if you're in a hole, and you know you're in a hole, stop digging. And the reality is to keep putting more money into that strategy should have ceased a long time ago. And a partnering with the textiles industry, I believe, and this is my position, that that's, that's where the future lies. Cliff is convinced the sector's answer is to create something like a Fonterra. He says it's worked for dairy, for meat, and for kiwifruit. 
Wool is the only thing that you dump at the gate and hope someone's going to take it away. After the disestablishment of the Wool Board, the farmer-owned company Wool Equities Limited was formed. Cliff wasn't happy. They appointed a board who decided, again at that point, that Wool effectively had no future. Instead, the company decided to invest in a new product, keratin, which involved melting wool down with chemicals to produce a product for the skin care market. They basically burnt the best part of, depending on whose arithmetic you believe, somewhere between 20 and 40 million, was burnt trying to create this product and create some sort of mega market for it. And it, and it was a complete dismal failure in the end. Six years and a proxy war later, Cliff emerged as chairman of Wool Equities. Was it a bitter struggle? Oh, I don't think so. Um, some of them, them may see it as bitter. But Cliff wasn't finished. Last year, Wool Equities tried to merge with Scarring Company New Zealand Wool Services. But the endeavour fell short of the $40 million needed to complete the task. Nobody at all told us what we were trying to do was wrong. However, they weren't prepared to put the money in, put their hand in their pocket and put sufficient money on the table to actually make the, make the deal happen. The man, once described as a streetwise crusader, grew up on a dairy farm in South Auckland. For a little white guy in South Auckland, you had to be fairly um, quick on your feet um, and, and reasonably um, gifted with what you had to say particularly if you were, you were someone who largely led with their chin, which is sort of part of my problem, or asset, depending on how you see it. A trained meteorologist with a physics degree and a business degree, Cliff has been a debt collector, a political advisor, and has been involved in what he describes as the once were warriors side of the liquor industry. 50 years ago, every small town had a textile factory. Now you could probably count on probably 20 20 small towns having some sort of major um, employer in textiles. What's the future of this mill? If sky's the limit, we have the best wool, we have great fibre like alpaca, possum fur, mohair, so textiles should be strong in New Zealand. Louis Gunderson shares Cliff Heath's philosophy. Wool is a great product, um, but too long it's just been sold as, as a commodity. And so too does Danelle Byrne. There's a demand for New Zealand made product and I think that people need to push it a lot more and we need to have more New Zealand made product. How far do you still have to go? I would like to think we're on the way. Um, in terms of time, um, I believe you know, two to three years, then I believe we'll have a, a small structure that's starting to look like Fonterra. Will you get there? Oh, categorically, yes. Cliff hopes Bruce Woolen Mill will be the start of something new, that a number of textile companies will come together. And he says the ultimate objective would be to merge Wool Equities with Wool Services and carpet company Cavalier. Then what we've got then is something that trades 40% of New Zealand's wool. Is it achievable? Yes, it is. How's it going to be achieved? Farmers have to want to do it. Neil Parker reporting from Milton. And next, exporters look to the future to ensure free trade is fair trade. Stay with Sector Report. Everyone knows it's tough times for international trade, but there's some good news in a survey just completed by Export New Zealand. More than 68% of our exporters see their orders growing over the next year. Nearly 52% can see their profitability improving and nearly 36% of our exporters expect to employ more people. But it's not all roses. And with me now to discuss the survey findings is the Executive Officer from Export New Zealand, Catherine Lai. Catherine, welcome. Uh, from a farmer's perspective, just how representative uh, were the exporters who were responding to your survey? Right, there were about 200, approximately 200 survey respondents to the survey and they were representative across 
a wide range of mm -hmm. industry uh, sectors, um, selling into a wide variety of markets. 55% of them were in manufacturing yes. and 16% of them were in agriculture, forestry or fishing. That's correct. But I suppose some of the manufacturers handle farm product. Yes, yeah. yes, there is a crossover there. Okay, mm. now the majority of them were positive, but how positive were they compared to previous years? Yeah, I think when we look back over the last three years, um, one thing that's quite remarkable about our exporters is their optimism. Mm. You know, they're very resilient. They understand that uh, good things take time. Does this mean they're often wrong? They, they if you can, say they're they very resilient and they're very <laughs> optimistic, I've got to say things have been pretty yeah, tough many, on many the trade scene. Yes, and yeah, many mistakes can be can be made, um, but the great thing is that there's a great deal of support support networks out there um, where they have the opportunity to learn from um, exporters who have been in the field for many years and can help them. Well, around 68% can see their orders growing over mm. the next year, mm. uh, albeit uh, most say slowly. Mm. Um, but do they think it's going to be profitable growth? Well, it was quite interesting looking at the, the survey results and we saw that about 51% expect that their uh, profitability will rise substantially and you've got about 38% where they expect it will um, re remain the same. So that's quite... That's and, and could you put that against any particular... Were they trading in... The, the ones who were going to... Mm. The 51%, where were I they think, trading? I think no. there's, a, there's a number of factors that you can attribute to the profitability. I think a lot of... There's a big focus on um, value-add manufacturing, mm -hmm. um, where there's a lot of innovation in behind uh, a lot of the products and services that the exporters are um, exporting. Um, and that, in turn, you know, they're getting close to the, the customer. Mm -hmm. and really um, coming up with products that really meet their needs. However, uh, mm -hmm. one of the important things about it is um, whether they're really focused on the growth economies right now. Mm. I mean, looking at what they see as their important markets mm. versus what are the growth markets is mm. not necessarily the same thing. Is it? Mm. Oh, I, mean, I think the short answer that, to that is uh, yes, the, the exporters are definitely focused on um, the growth markets. Um, I think it's fair to say that there's, no, there's not going to be a sudden turnaround in the USA or Europe. So, you know, China and the ASEAN uh, countries, um, even Latin America is a focus for some of them. With the US market, I think some of them still have a, um, have a long term, mm -hmm. have had a long term relationship with that market, especially the ICT sector. They're mm -hmm. particularly uh, strong in the, in the US. What do they see as the main obstacles to their growth? I think uh, there are about four or five um, main obstacles that were cited as a result of the survey. Uh, the first one being demand offshore, the next one being price competitiveness, uh, the next one being exchange rate volatility, although I think it's probably fair to say with respect to the exchange rate we th should be thankful that we're not Australia because their rate, exchange rate has appreciated a lot mm. more than ours has. Uh, and also assistance for export market development. And I have to say as well, um, compliance issues domestically mm -hmm. and uh, regulatory barriers to trade. Okay, give me a picture about some of these regulatory issues. You mentioned some of them were actually happening in New Zealand. A lot of the work involved in, um, in time, time and cost involved in um, export and import documentation. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a and that's, and a, that's a domestic requirement. It's not being driven from offshore. Well, I mean, yeah, you've got both the you've got the import documentation, which is for offshore, but you've got your export documentation that you need to produce. It's, um, it's one, one, one of the things that I noticed was that they talked about phytosanitary requirements. They didn't think they were quite in line with what actually the markets required. Phytosanitary uh, uh, is is where a lot of testing yeah. is undergone for pests. Okay. So basically, yeah, if you're looking at it exporting some fruit or um, vegetables into a certain market, then um, they undergo a number of tests. Sometimes you're looking at 50 to 60 uh, pests that are being tested for, for mm -hmm. those um, particular products. So it's, it's quite a time consuming um, process. And then in addition to that, you've got local industry, um, well, government going to local industry for their feedback. And that can come back with a whole new set of problems. Yeah.
everyone talks free trade, trade liberalisation and barriers coming mm. down and so on. Mm. But um, are some of the countries that we currently, we see as free trade partners these mm. days, finding some new regulatory barriers to replace some of the old ones that have been eliminated? Mm. We, we haven't received, Export New Zealand certainly hasn't received any feedback from our members as yet uh, to that, um, to encountering such issues or problems. I think the um, main thing to understand is that when these free trade agreements are established, it is for the movement of goods from New Zealand to the, the port in, whether it's China or India. Mm -hmm. So what actually happens across the border is, is, a, is another issue. Yes, because yeah. it seems that uh, in China, for instance, things change. Mm. And they change very rapidly from mm. day to day almost yes. for some of the exporters. And they're yeah, a bit so, worried about that. So if you're moving from province to province, you can be incurring ah. taxes. And, and I mean, I think this used to happen uh, in Australia. We're moving from, between, from state to state. You encountered taxes and additional costs. But I, given the maturity of the relationship we have now with Australia, a lot of these have been alleviated. So in good time, I think. We've got, we've got a real queue of uh, trade deals in the pipeline mm. to be done. Are we likely to see any of them open up and create real <laughs> growth opportunities in the next year? Well, I'm probably not the best person. <laughs> I know, I should ask Tim answer. Grosser. You should ask Tim, yeah. <laughs> the lead negotiators Tim, yeah. for, for those um, agreements. But yeah, there's certainly um, a lot of work being done, as we all know, on the TPP. Uh, we've got Russia, Kazakhstan and Belarus lined up and things seem to be progressing well there. I'd, I'd say that, 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 would be the, <laughs> that is likely to probably be the next one. That, uh -huh. that is signed. Uh, you've got India, uh, Korea. Korea's quite tricky because they're very um, sensitive around their agricultural uh, products. And we have Taiwan. Uh -huh. on the on the horizon, so but we're looking to engage with Interesting them. to hear that Belarus is, is probably the hot prospect. I'm sure Valerie Adams will <laughs> <Yes>. be delighted. <laughs> no, <I was laughs> Catherine, that. thank you very much. You're very welcome. Catherine Lai, the Executive Officer at Export New Zealand. And coming up, what's driving the increase in recycling round rural New Zealand? The Rural Recycling Program AgRecovery has been up and running for eight years now, but it's been sprinting over the last year. AgRecovery provides solutions to farm waste problems. The plastic containers and wrapping and those leftover agricultural chemicals. In the last year, the collection of waste chemicals was up 23%. And it's doubled its take of silage plastic to more than 240,000 kilograms. To find out what happens next, Here's AgRecovery's North Island coordinator, Leon McPhillips. Leon, thanks for joining us. Uh, tough question first. Why don't local authorities do the job that you're doing? Um, local authorities, uh, to a point, do do the jobs with their landfills, um, but what we've found is that it's a specialised job. Um, we, we set the AgRecovery uh, recycling scheme up um, by talking to farmers and agricultural members and we set it up for them. Uh, we've specialised in it. Um, the local authorities are actually part of the um, trustees that, that oversee ag recovery, um, mm. but we have specialist containers at rural retail stores and, and sites throughout the country with contractors, and we pick up the wrap side of things on farm. So we're, we're taking away the, um, the need for the local authorities to be involved to that point. But what's actually driven people to say we've got to have an egg recovery program that you're running? It's, it's been a, um, the supply chain um, mm. have, have been driving it so in terms of um, those companies that are exporting New Zealand um, products overseas their, their customers have been asking for confirmation of what sustainable practices are farmers and growers um, completing when they're um, in New Zealand and we're also getting bottom up from the farmers themselves saying that uh, behavioural changes, we need to be doing something with these containers and this wrap and this chemical that previously we've um, 
been either burning or dumping. Well, you've experienced quite considerable growth in the uh, amount of uh, material you've been collecting in the last 12 months. Uh, uh, quite significant increases in, in plastic silage wrap and certainly a 29%, uh, I think it was, increase in uh, the amount of agricultural chemicals you've been, you've been collecting. What's actually driving that growth in demand? I think the growth in, in demand is probably through the, um, if, if we look at the uh, chemical container side of things, we've made it fairly easy for farmers to be able to recycle. Um, we've put uh, container sites throughout New Zealand, there's over 70 sites, and they're at um, re mainly retail stores and also contractors, so there's access. These are the places where they actually buy the products they, some that of are them contained are, in these things that you're, uh, or wrapped in the, uh, yeah. wrapped in the substances you're, you're collecting. Yeah, some of the retail stores <coughs> actually yeah. have the facility to um, take the containers back. Um, if not, we try to have one in a town nearby. So you've been stepping up the efficiency of, of that collection operation because you've been uh, increasing the number of collection points. We have, okay. yes. Um, what about demand from the processes of the recyclable materials? Has that been growing? Um, there's not a lot of processes in New Zealand to be able to um, uh, process the materials we give them. Um, one processor in particular though takes all our um, mm. chemical containers and they use them for underground cable cover. Um, yeah. And we can't keep up at the moment with the demand for that. So well, that's, that's one good there's thing. There's a lot of cable going, around, yeah. going in around the country at the moment, of course. Um, what, about, uh, what about offshore demand? Is there offshore demand for, for, for the materials you collect or is it not worthwhile? Uh, there is. The, the silage wrap, again, it's, it's the difficulty and the challenge trying to find a processor within New Zealand to be able to um, uh, process what equates to um, enough silage wrap to go eight times around the world every year is used in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So that at the moment we've got a specialised processor offshore and they turn that into a membrane for building paper um, that goes under underneath concrete. So it has got a um, specific recycled use. There's one area where there's a particular challenge and that's in the handling of the agricultural chemicals. Now tell me about that. The chemicals are generally just, as you say, left there. Um, we we've have a lot of situations. Last year we collected over 16,000 kilos of um, expired or mm -hmm. unused or unknown chemical and that was um, up on the previous year as well. A lot of it happens when farms either change, um, when they're either sold or they're transferred or, or converted to a, from a uh, dry stock farm to a dairy conversion, mm -hmm. or um, you know, someone passes away. Or the share market changes or something yeah. like that. Or someone passes <coughs> away and mm. the family find all this mm. chemical. Um, and generally we um, have a very good working relationship with the companies, the chemical companies, and depending on what the product is, um, there's assistance there with our program. Um, otherwise, if, if we're unable to determine what it is or it's a particular chemical that um, is very hazardous, then it goes offshore to be destroyed. I suspect a hell of a lot of this stuff actually gets burnt on the farm. I mean, do you think farmers are really aware of the dangers they expose themselves to when they do that? Um, the, the farmers that I talk to, um, especially the older farmers, on the, in the first instance may sort of dismiss the program, but in the next breath they'll say, we know what we've been doing for the last 20 or 30 years. <coughs> yeah, well, they, they probably have to take the next breath too, <laughs> if they're not careful. <laughs> uh, but uh, tell me, are there safe disposal facilities readily available to you? Because you're handling a hell of a lot of this stuff. We've got um, specialist operators that handle the materials and as I said they are then shipped offshore. Um, our chemicals at the moment go to France mm -hmm. and they have a special um, underground facility there where the containers are actually incinerated and the product that's in them as well. How does your operation get funded? Uh, the container program is funded through the um, brand owners that are part of the chemical container collection program, okay. so uh, which can be animal, animal remedies, um, chemicals um, and, and other similar containers. And there's a levy that they pay into that fund and mm -hmm. that levy covers it. The uh, wrap side of the program is a user pay system. So we provide the um, bag for them to be able to recycle the materials and then we take them away. But how frequently do you have, uh, well, how widespread is your coverage and how frequently is your, is your collection? Okay, with the um, container program, we do that on a, um, as it's starting to become full, we have containers, either 20 foot or 40 foot containers spread throughout New Zealand. As I said, mm -hmm. there's 70 sites. Um, some of our sites are emptied every four to six weeks. That's how busy they are. Some of them take 12 to 18 months. Um, the 
silage wrap side of things, we um, will pick that up on farm when the farmer rings and we guarantee to pick that up within 90 days. The collection date at the moment is uh, half that. Quick answer, can you ever see a program like this being self-funded? If we can get at least 70% of farmers and growers recycling, then it could get to that situation. Leon, thanks very much. Not a problem. Leon McPhillips, a North Island Coordinator for Ag Recovery. And that's all from Sector Report for now. Remember, you can check out our programs anytime online at country99tv.co.nz. Thanks for your company. I'm David Beetson. See you next time.